You did it. Uh huh. It should be right. Looks good. Yep. What's up? All right, I have noon Eastern time. So we're going to uh, get started on discussing the future of employment arbitration. And we're defining the future as the next 10 to 15 years, right? So looking ahead, what's in store for the institution. Um, and I want to make an announcement. I, is Dave in the audience? Um, this is the second session of the Future of ADR series uh, that is being presented by Lyra and specifically the uh, dispute resolution interest section. And there are loads of people to thank. Thank you, Lyra. Thank you, Emily Bernadette. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Driss Leadership. But also thank you, David Lipsky, um, who is an institution in and unto himself. He recently retired from Cornell. Um, Many of us in the room have probably interacted. All of us in the room have directly been, or indirectly at least, uh, benefited from uh, Dave's uh, leadership in the field over uh, essentially, a, you know, more than a half century. Um, and I don't see him in the room, but uh, uh, if, you, if you ever do run into Dave, make sure to thank him. He's a great guy and this series is dedicated uh, to, to in, in his honor. Uh, the rules of the road today, this is true for the first session, and then we're going to have two uh, 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 subsequent sessions after. I think the rules uh, are going to stay the same. This is designed to be a conversation, not necessarily a, a, a one-sided presentation. So please, though, even though it is a conversation, mute yourself when you come in and stay muted until you are um, uh, ready to, to speak. Um, so initially, please pose all your questions in the chats. We have what's, we, we've designated a quote unquote chat monitor. Our, uh, the speakers, I as the moderator, won't necessarily address your questions in real time, but a chat monitor will aggregate these questions and we have time at toward the end of the presentation where we're going to address them. Um, when we get through those, we'll also have verb, you know, a verbal discussion where please feel free to unmute yourself when you're ready to speak, when, when you're called on. Um, just a warning, this for everybody, this session is recorded and it's gonna be made available on Lyra. And we're gonna be very strict about the start and end time. So this session ends at 1 p.m. out of respect for the 1.15 uh, session and the audience's well-being, who I think might need a break uh, between sessions. So um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed panelists for the next hour. Uh, Jackie Drucker, uh, who is an arbitrator, and Christine Newhall, the senior vice president at the AAA, which, uh, um, and then I am uh, Mark Goff. I'm a professor at uh, Penn State School of labor and employment relations. Uh, so at this, I will hand it over to our panelists. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, and I, I thought I would just uh, make a few observations initially uh, about what we're talking about when we talk about employment arbitration. Um, and I can tell from the, the attendees that this is a sophisticated group and is probably up to speed on most of this, but still I think it's useful to make sure that we know that uh, uh, we're all, uh, it, what it is we're talking about. Uh, when we think about employment arbitration and the public attention that has been given um, to employment arbitration in the years since the Gilmer decision in the 90s, um, it has been primarily discrimination cases and more recently uh, wage and hour cases and the issues associated with class action waivers. 
Uh, but in terms of, of those cases that come to those of us who function as employment arbitrators, and as Christine can comment in a moment, what uh, AAA and the providers are handling under this broad uh, category of employment arbitration, uh, includes a variety of other issues, formats, parties, um, beyond that typical ADR plan or mandatory arbitration agreement that's in a, an application. Um, and it includes what has existed for decades and decades and well uh, before uh, the Gilmer decision um, in individual contracts. And sometimes those are you know, middle management contracts and they are essentially mandatory conditions of employment that uh, the employee needs to sign on to. Um, but also there are an endless number of contracts out there between lawyers and doctors and their employers and uh, of course people in the securities industry which gave rise to its whole unique in some ways uh, development of procedures and law um, that have been revised recently. Um, and individuals who and businesses which want to have the benefit of the privacy that arbitration affords. And generally we think of that as a negative thing. And it's one of the reasons that led, for example, I think to the state of New York to um, develop legislation that precluded uh, or barred the enforceability of mandatory arbitration clauses um, in sexual harassment cases. And that was, of course, um, uh, invalidated by the courts. Um, but the thinking there is that employers go into these mandatory employment arbitration plans with the idea of avoiding juries, avoiding class actions, and avoiding public scrutiny. But there are many parties who, on both sides, willingly enter into uh, a pre-dispute arbitration agreement uh, for many reasons, but one of them very often is the privacy that it affords. And interestingly, I think um, the potential is there even for post-dispute issues um, in the sexual harassment area, because we have claimants who actually are not thrilled with the idea of all the nuances of their case unfolding in a public courtroom. So those are, um, that, that is kind of the broad scope of employment arbitration. And it includes not just statutory issues, but contractual issues and uh, things such as trade secret protections, confidentiality provisions, anti-poaching agreements, uh, and a broad range of questions that fall into that category. So I just wanted to take a moment to set that up um, so we know what we're talking about as we talk about the future of this broad area of employment uh, arbitration. And I think maybe, maybe Christine would kind of weigh in on what AAA sees within the scope sure. of employment arbitration? Thank you, Jackie. Um, you know, in the broad uh, definition for the association for employment arbitration is that their workplace disputes uh, handled through arbitration, but also I think sometimes we forget to mention the use of mediation in the employment area. Um, mediation is used quite frequently and at different stages uh, of the arbitration process. But in general, the workplace disputes uh, handled through arbitration or mediation is when an employment plan or an executive contract, and I think Jackie, you alluded to that with many of um, the individual almost contracts between um, an individual that is on an executive level uh, that has a dispute resolution clause in the document, whether in a plan or in a negotiated contract. And I thought I'd share today some of the areas where the industries where we are seeing both plan cases and uh, the multiple case filings, which we'll talk about um, later on in this program or this dialogue. Um, most of our cases are in the retail uh, area, healthcare, uh, and financial services, as well as uh, the restaurant and food service. Um, technology is a, is a growing area as well. In many of the cases that we have recently gotten, especially over the last year, transportation is an area that is growing. And also, what is a workplace? Um, I think we use the terminology uh, workplace, and we used to think that that was a brick and mortar building. And as uh, I know that many of us, if not all of us, 
uh, on this dialogue today, our workplace has changed. Uh, it, it's probably a hybrid uh, in the office or um, at home. Uh, we also have workplaces with the gig economy uh, and different um, businesses that have evolved over the last five years, uh, if not 10 years. So what is a workplace uh, may come up uh, to an arbitrator uh, or a mediator when uh, serving in the employment area. Um, so I think the employment arbitration um, is, we do have definitions, our rules have definitions, we uh, have protocols which uh, have kind of definitions, but I think what is a workplace is going to continue as time goes on to change, uh, because we've had to change. So um, what is employment arbitration? We, we know what it is potentially right now, but what will it be in the future? I think we'll continue to see different changes um, in not only the workplace, but how arbitration and dispute resolution uh, is available in the area of employment. Thanks. Uh, let's take a look at then the future of employment arbitration. Um, we do have to uh, acknowledge in our discussion uh, that uh, the future is a little fuzzy right now. Um, there um, have been legislative efforts in, in Congress and of course the states, but I, I'd like to focus on Congress um, because of the FAA's application here and the effective preemption. Um, there have been uh, efforts in prior Congresses to enact what's generally referred to as the FAIR Act. Um, currently pending in Congress um, is uh, the a renewed version of the FAIR Act, um, and also the PRO Act from the Biden administration, which is the Biden administration's um, uh, reform of, broad reform of labor law, but it also includes a uh, prohibition on mandatory, of mandatory arbitration in the workplace. The FAIR Act um, would ban uh, pre-dispute arbitration in a broad range of areas, including employment. It would include employment, uh, consumer, antitrust, and uh, there's another one uh, that uh, I'm drawing, oh, um, I'm drawing a complete blank on what the other one is, um, civil rights. So we've got consumer, employer, civil rights, and antitrust, um, for which there is an effort in Congress to um, um, make unenforceable uh, pre-dispute employment arbitration agreements. And uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, hearings began in the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial and Administration, Administrative Law uh, in February, and um, they're moving forward. I don't I'm, I'm not inclined to speculate as to uh, what will happen. Um, I think for our purposes of our discussion, we uh, can only proceed today um, with the uh, idea that employment arbitration will continue to be valid. The pre-dispute employment arbitra ar arbitration agreements will continue to be enforceable. Uh, those who say, well, you can always do post-dispute agreements to arbitrate. I think the indication right now is that there are very few of those um, kinds of agreements that if it's not agreed to in advance of the dispute, it is far, far, far less likely that the parties would jointly agree after a dispute arises for um, differences in bargaining and positioning and so forth. Um, but I did want to mention that uh, I think the, the future is unclear in that regard. And then uh, I think we can go on from there. Um, Christine, any comments on the legislation? Um, it's difficult as a, a neutral administrative agency to comment on the specific legislation, but I uh, will share with everyone that, you know, the association does educate. Um, the con Congress members, uh, both uh, House and, and Senate on what arbitration is. Uh, we have taken the time to respond to the judiciary meeting that was held uh, in February um, to outline kind of what the positives are uh, and what exists to potentially protect um, the process. Um, but, you know, will there be changes? Um, I think yes, um, but does employment arbitration and dispute resolution have a future? Um, I believe yes, uh, it may change uh, and the changes may be for a positive. Um, but we, the association, are going to continue to educate um, and to provide information on the process, like the protocol, our rules, 
our panel, um, all of the things that make arbitration work. Um, our job is to educate and we're gonna continue to do that. And of course, be engaged, um, be engaged in order to um, educate and provide necessary information so the best decisions are made in the future. Um, I should note that uh, in all of the, as indicated on the slides, in um, all of the proposals that seem to make their way through Congress, um, the prohibitions would not apply to collective bargaining agreements. There has been great care taken to make sure that um, our, our process of labor arbitration um, remains untouched. Um, and I think the, the congressional examination of the process opens the door for us to examine some of the things we can talk about today, which is how to make the process better and what the plans are to improve the process as we go forward. Um, but in the wake of the pandemic, uh, I think uh, uh, an immediate question on everyone's mind is uh, what do employment arbitration proceedings um, look like as we cast our eyes out um, into the next 10 years with the experience that uh, we have had using virtual platforms, uh, which uh, have become um, almost uh, accepted uh, in most of the hearings that, that I and I know many of my um, uh, colleagues and I know the American Arbitration Association has um, seen a tremendous acceptance in gradual movement over the course of the last year. But uh, ultimately, I mean, I have uh, employment arbitrations coming up um, in early next year, where it's just assumed that it'll be easier for us to do it on a virtual platform. Uh, but uh, since Christine has been operating this and oversees the, the physical structures in which in-person uh, hearings take place, um, maybe we can uh, see what your, your thoughts and projections are, Christine. Well, I, I, um, I actually think, you know, when I look back a year ago, um, when March 17th or March 18th hit, and we were, uh, you know, shutting down our kind of business, the normal business, uh, it was like, what are we going to do? And we kept pushing out the time frame. Okay, hearings won't be held for this month or the next month or, or the following month. And uh, the association was quite flexible and um, actually started using the virtual platform. Most of our hearings are um, utilizing Zoom. And what we're finding is that the cases are moving through the forum of arbitration uh, at a quicker rate uh, because there aren't delays. There aren't delays. Uh, and I've had these delays in my life living. I, I live in Boston, traveled quite extensively prior to the pandemic, and I would be stuck in you know, commuting traffic. Uh, or sitting at an airport and how am I going to get to this meeting? Um, we are finding that cases are moving faster through the process due to limited delays. And one of the other things because of the use of um, virtual platforms is the flexibility, the flexibility to schedule um, at various times during a workday. Um, although most things are still happening between the nine to five, we've had unique situations where, where parties will say, well, if the arbitrator's um, you know, available for a quick status conference at 5.30, I can do it at 5.30. It's more of an effective use of time by the use of that virtual platforms. Um, you know, we do find, you know, the pre-hearing steps, the preliminary hearings, the status conferences where people are now seeing each other, they're looking at each other. And um, I find that there's more concentration. You can't, you have to see somebody. So you're paying attention versus, and I will admit to this during conference calls, which used to be the norm that you get on a conference call, um, did I cheat a little bit and check my email? Did I pay attention to 100% of what was being said? Um, and I find that the conference calls went far longer than some of the virtual platform calls where people are on Zoom or WebEx or whatever platform they're using. It's a more effective use of their time, um, which um, I, I will tell you, there is a looking at the statistical data from 2020 and into 2021, a higher amount of 
uh, potential settlements of cases earlier on in the process. And I think there is, I, I'm, I'm not saying, and I know uh, Mark is on the phone and, uh, you know, on this uh, statistically, I'm just looking at comparing 2019 to 2020, a higher amount of uh, potential settlements of cases because parties are communicating better and earlier on and on a more consistent uh, basis. Um, I will say that we have had um, hybrid hearings where some, the parties are in the room with the witness and the arbitrator or mediator is remote. Um, and that has, we, we do think that we will have more hybrid hearings going forward. Um, I will share with the audience that we are seeing a tick up, um, a little bit scheduling in-person hearings for um, the later summer months, August, uh, and September, and merely the fact that anybody wants to schedule in August is a phenomena uh, in my world because um, August was one of those, oh no, you can't do anything in August. And now August has come back on the table. Um, so Jackie, I don't know, I, I will also share with you that we're uh, cataloging some unique um, locations that arbitrators have held he hearings in person. Uh, we had one arbitrator use a campsite uh, last summer um, to hold in-person hearings that were necessary. The parties wanted it. Uh, and he came up with an alternative that met the needs uh, of those parties. But Jackie, I know you've been in the thick of it and, and are on the front line actually dealing with cases um, through Zoom or whatever um, modem that you, you utilize. It, uh, I, I think there are going to be lasting effects. And yes, we've, we've been creative for those few instances in which there has been a need for an in-person um, proceeding or an element of the proceeding. And that's actually been uh, kind of uh, uh, oddly enjoyable <laughs> in uh, seeing the, uh, the problem solving and the teamwork that goes into making something like that work. Uh, but it's also the case for the, uh, the shift to the virtual platform. And um, I think the, the long-term expectation is, um, or prediction, uh, is very right along the lines of what Christine is describing, uh, that we'll have greater efficiencies. And even if we're moving to um, the in-person hearing being the routine way in which we conduct employment arbitrations, I think there will be a less, um, there will be fewer loss, <clears throat> excuse me, of hearing days because of Sudden, sudden witness unavailability. Um, and um, there also, I think, will be the incorporation of this um, technology to achieve substantial cost savings when we have witnesses strewn throughout the world, for example, um, and then they can beam in. And we also have, as Christine was saying, flexibility as to the timing. Um, I've had hearings begin at 8 o'clock, uh, which is not 8 a.m., <laughs> which is uh, not that much of a problem for people when they're joining from their homes, uh, children and pets aside. Um, but uh, we also can uh, adjust our timing for uh, people who are in other time zones more readily. So I think there is real potential to use the virtual platform to make the process more efficient uh, and faster uh, in, um, in the future. And uh, there's an interesting element in employment arbitration is contrasted with labor. Um, and I know labor will be discussed in the next session, so I don't want to veer too far into that. Um, but I think there will be some lasting changes in labor from the fact that pre-hearings didn't really exist in labor arbitration, but the virtual platform makes that necessary in many settings. And I think that there's a, a recognition um, that that has helped and has made the labor process in some instances more efficient and effective. Those pre-hearing processes have always existed in employment arbitration, but the potential for the virtual platform has made them more productive, more effective, and as Christine said, increases the chance of discussing settlement, um, which has occurred in some of my cases, even when we are uh, conferring to hammer out the, you know, the pre-hearing order that relates to the virtual platform process, and also during a test session. Um, you get everybody together, they're in the test session, you have a breakout room, and uh, uh, there is uh, an enhanced opportunity that doesn't exist if you're doing it by telephone to discuss and explore settlement.
I think the future is bright with the virtual platform element of employment arbitration. Just and to, I, oh, sorry, go on, go on Christine. I, I just wanna also share, as we think of in-person hearings, there are so many restrictions. The rooms that we thought would fit in the future 10, 15, 20 people because of the restrictions and the separation and what needs to be done for people to be in a hearing. Some of our larger hearing rooms that used to have 15 now because of the setup can have six people or seven people in them. So you're gonna be restricted uh, and it's costly to rent, rent a ballroom. Although I have heard of a few cases where uh, in-person hearing because it was a very sensitive uh, discharge case. The parties needed and wanted an in-person and they utilized a ballroom at a hotel. And I did do follow-up with those parties afterwards. And it, it was difficult. It was difficult because of the, the room uh, echoing uh, where people had to sit. Um, so I think we have to be careful. There may be in-person hearings, but you're still gonna have to be required to follow um, you know, the CDC, state and um, federal and local uh, laws relating to people in a room. In, in those situations, I've been in a few ballrooms um, and those situations, it, it's almost essential to have a sound system and miking uh, because in a great big room where you have people spread out as Christine was describing with masks, it is so difficult to comprehend, but that can be um, mitigated substantially if you've got a miking system, which a lot of the court reporters of course are using. And just to interject about what the future of us employment arbitration may look like 10 to 15 years from now. Uh, I think Jackie and Christine, you're coming from the perspective of le existing legitimate institutions, um, the changes that, that you're adopting. I do think that there, um, there are newcomers in, into the field. And I, I don't wanna say I've been tracking a dozen, less than a dozen that I've seen but that take very different approaches than what I see the existing uh, players taking in terms of arbitration hearings. There are some startups that are doing, that's, that's all asynchronous hearings where um, uh, the, the parties go ahead and upload all their documents. They can upload videos, et cetera, et cetera. And to prevent delays, not everyone has to be there at the same time. The arbitrator can come in, ask their questions and the parties have, what, a week, 72 hours to address it um, on their own time. And um, so I think I want to uh, uh, leave room perhaps for a more radical prediction of, of the future, which is just these growth of, of new arbitration providers. Um, because arbitration isn't really a new, or employment arbitration isn't a new institution anymore. It's 30, you know, it's decades old at this point. And, and so I think we're gonna start seeing more established branches um, in, in the future and new providers coming out, um, which admittedly I have, you know, I have concerns about, but some of them have actually adopted gamification approach to settlements and arbitration. You get a badge if you, um, uh, you know, if you settle, that they'll tell you, you know, uh, they use uh, artificial intelligence to predict settlements and settlement amounts. They'll say, hey, there's a 90% chance the parties will settle for X amounts. Which, uh, uh, I have uh, um, concerns about all these approaches, but nonetheless, I want to leave room for the growth of these approaches in, in the future. Um, and, and I do hope that, stat, that there are established players um, and institutions to act as gatekeepers. And I hope that, that we don't use, uh, lose those gatekeeper roles. Um, but again, for everyone in this audience, I think most of you are part of those established gatekeepers. Um, so please be on the lookout for new players and make sure uh, um, some of the more provocative approaches, I think we should be proactive about. I think we've seen um, some um, uh, of of pop-up arbitration systems uh, that have come out of and for years from uh, class action settlements. And it's interesting what you're seeing, Mark, uh, because in some of those with which I've uh, been involved, um, there is a um, kind of uh, 
a highly modified uh, version of arbitration that takes place. And uh, sometimes it's effective and sometimes it's, it's not. <laughs> Uh, can uh, can we talk for a moment about um, about the panel and uh, who uh, right now and this is actually right on the heels of what uh, Mark is citing um, the those who are conducting uh, these employment arbitrations that we're seeing now and that we hope to see for the future um, very often are coming from uh, the panel that has been carefully uh, constructed by the American Arbitration Association. And uh, Christine, maybe you can tell us what, what you see there. Sure, um, you know, the, the association, uh, it, it's very important that our panel um, have the qualifications to serve uh, and also have the expertise uh, and specifically in the area of employment law, our minimum qualifications and uh, are at least 10 years experience in employment law with 50% of one's field at um, devoted to employment. Um, although retired judges, academics and other arbitrators that have experience obviously are on our panel and at one point, um, probably in their career, devoted a fair amount of time to, uh, whether as an advocate or, or as a neutral in serving in the employment area. Um, the, the standards, you know, the code of ethics exists, the application process, the criteria and responsibilities for members of our panel are all posted uh, on our website. And we take that very seriously. Not everyone that applies to the American Arbitration Association panel is admitted. Um, we need that expertise because the parties that utilize our services require that. They want panelists serving that know about employment law. Um, and that's a broad statement because there are, uh, as Jackie uh, in her opening alluded to, there are very specialized cases within the employment area. And there may be arbitrators that have employment background, but also financial background. And we try to match the list of arbitrators that go out on cases to, to the criteria or to what the parties are looking for in the arbitrator in terms of expertise. We're also looking for representation from plaintiff defense. Um, you know, we always look for that per perfect person, uh, you know, the 50-50. Um, uh, I have uh, many requests from advocates. Well, I want arbitrators on the list that have 50% plaintiff, 50% defense. And sometimes if, if anyone can find that wealth of person uh, that's an advocate that does that, and there are some, uh, but it's not the majority of those uh, advocates that are experienced in uh, employment law. You know, the, um, we're very committed to the diversity um, uh, of our panel. Um, the entire AAA roster is composed of 20%, 27% of women in uh, minorities. Um, and we're continuing to work to increase that. But I will share with you that on our employment panel, um, currently our employment panel is 42% uh, diverse. Uh, and we have been able, um, because of those that are um, serving as advocates in the employment area and then um, brought onto our panel, we have increased the diversity of that. And actually our uh, employment panel is more diverse than even our uh, labor panel. Um, you know, we also, you know, that plans for the future. Um, I would just like to share uh, that we do have the AAA Higginbotham Fellows and many of you have um, assisted us uh, with working with the Higginbotham Fellows. It was created in 2009 um, to provide training, networking, and mentorships um, for up and coming diverse ADR practitioners. Um, and we have had and continue uh, this program to have our fellows um, advance to appointment to the AAA roster. And many have been um, admitted to the roster and are selected to serve on cases. And we're quite proud of that. Um, and, and the few plans for the future for the panel, you know, there is training, there is, you know, all of those things, but also we want to continue to partner with minority bar and trade groups to have a joint 
um, arbitrator recruitment and training possibilities. We have worked with the National Association of Minority and Women Owned Law Firms, as well as the National Bar Association, and there are many others. And we, in the future, plan to continue to collect, you know, work with them, partner, um, and have qualified diverse arbitrators added to our uh, panel. It, on the on the point of uh, diversity, I uh, note uh, some discussion in the chat, which I think we'll probably get to in, in a moment, um, but relating to arbitrators making credibility determinations. And um, I think it, the discussion has arisen with regard to the use of virtual platforms. Um, and I think most um, arbitrators will tell you that um, the idea of, of demeanor and eye contact and uh, other aspects of um, observing a, a person's behavior um, has over time and with experience uh, to most arbitrators become far less significant in assessing credibility uh, than other factors such as um, consistency, corroboration, um, uh, recollection, communication, and also plausibility. And when we get into the area of plausibility, is this the way things work in the real life? In real life, does this really make sense? And it's a one, the only point in life in which I would quote Judge Judy. <laughs> but Judge Judy has said uh, to um, more than one litigant in her courtroom, "Look at me. Do I have the word stupid stamped on my forehead?" Because it, the, what she's hearing just doesn't make sense. And what I think is interesting when we talk about who the arbitrators are hearing these cases, um, that we all have to recognize that our assessment of plausibility comes from our own life experience and how do things work in our real world. And it's very important for us at every step of the way to remember that our real world is not necessarily the real world of the witness. And so in assessing plausibility in terms of an account that's being given, um, we must always be aware of and sensitive to the diversity of experience. And I think enhancement of the diversity of the pool and the panel of arbitrators who are available to hear these cases um, will go a long way toward ensuring that um, there is a greater um, skill level even in assessing credibility points that come up in the course of arbitration hearings. Uh, do we wanna take a moment to, to talk about uh, accessibility of the forum and what we think might be happening in the future to make it more accessible. And I'll note that AAA has done some wonderful things to kind of um, help fulfill the promise of arbitration to make it more streamlined. Um, and among them are uh, the discovery protocols, um, one of which is tremendously helpful. Um, it, designed specifically for employment cases. And um, there are two sets, as I understand it, Christine, you can, <laughs> you can um, fill in the blanks here. Um, but a set of, of discovery protocols specifically for wage and hour cases, uh, which is um, tremendously helpful in kicking off that process and also ensuring that an employee is going to have um, access to the needed information to properly litigate uh, a wage and hour claim in the forum. Uh, but I think there are other steps underway, and you see reference also to Ted St. Antoine, who is with us somewhere, um, has written a wonderful piece proposing what employment arbitration may look like um, moving forward, and in a way in which it can provide what Ted often has cited as um, the opportunity for um, employees with uh, small claims who might not be able to navigate their way on their own through the court system, but could do so in arbitration and therefore have greater access to vindication of statutory rights um, through an arbitration system than in um, the, uh, when left to the judicial system and the um, uh, uh, discrimination claims that exist uh, outside of arbitration. Um, but uh, I, Christine, maybe you can talk about this. Yes. You know, the accessibility is important uh, and the association and I think all providers of um, dispute resolution services want to have the education done of uh, not only the advocates that are representing the parties, but individuals as well to 
um, you know, the videos, the YouTube videos, you know, what is arbitration and, and what can I expect from this arbitration process? And also setting up the process so there aren't unnecessary delays. Delays are one of the pain points uh, in arbitration in general. When you have delays because parties are, are asking for a postponement, a postponement when parties are trying to settle is a welcome postponement. But you do want to have the process, have check-in points, and have a process that moves forward, which is why we're constantly looking at our rules, what needs to be changed in our rules in order to keep with the times, you know, to keep with the world as it is changing, as we've just discussed with virtual hearings, um, as, as well as with recruitment of the panel, what's the panel look like in the future? What does the process look, in, look like in the future? We also want accessibility so that, um, and we do, limit what uh, individual uh, plaintiff would in the under the employment rules and the employment fee schedule, the, the fees paid by any uh, plaintiff or claimant are capped at $300. Um, and we also provide many waivers, hardship waivers on cases so that if there is um, any type of financial um, somebody is barred by financial situation that there are those processes so that it is accessible and it's the form that is necessary. Um, you know, making the arbitration fair uh, goes back to the employment protocol and making sure we review um, all planned cases where there is a plan that affects many employees to make sure that it is in um, conformance with the protocol. And potentially in the future, there may be changes to that protocol. Um, I believe if I have my years right, but time flies by, uh, the protocol was um, put into effect in 1996, could have been 1997, but I believe it's 1996. Um, and you know, is it, we've had many conversations about, is it time to look at that and uh, figure out what type of, um, you know, what should the protocol be for the future? Because in our world of dispute resolution uh, continues to change. Uh, and consistent with that, Christine, uh, I'm an academic, like I'm really concerned about public policy issues. And one of the key public policy issues, I think, with accessibility, and particularly in the future that I think is right now, perhaps not often looked at, but will be, and this was alluded to earlier in the presentation in terms of what is employment arbitration and how is employment arbitration going to change. And uh, so I think one area that I'm also concerned about is there are some um, firms where because of the whole idea of the employment relationship, it's becoming more fractured more tenuous, um, that there are some, uh, particularly in the gig economy, where uh, firms are, are uh, trying to hold their employees, their workers, you know, call independent contractors to commercial rules mm -hmm. of arbitration, which as you know, you know, those fees aren't capped, there's more kind of fee shifting allowed, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think that's going to be a headwind to some of these pressures to make particularly the, the AAA more accessible, but uh, I'm even more concerned about other new actors, whether they're following suit, whether they care as much about some of the existing institutions uh, uh, about kind of cost, quality, and access. I, I, Christine, is there, um, I've, I've had a few cases that come up um, employment issues, commercial rules, but I think isn't there an adjustment in the fee schedule when that happens? Yes, we we have um, kind of footnoted uh, within the commercial rules that uh, if it you know is a workplace dispute that the commercial rules may be used, but the employment fee schedule would apply to the dispute. Now there are some issues that do come up uh, where a company may argue that, and we will have put those arguments, we'll make the initial determination that commercial rules can apply. We will apply the uh, fee schedule, the employment fee schedule where it is capped. And then some of those issues do go to an arbitrator um, 
if the parties continue to argue. Our role is to move the case forward. We're going to move the case forward and the parties can bring that issue to um, the arbitrator if they so choose. The, the difference between the commercial rules and, and employment um, are, are not all that significant other than that issue. There's, there's an expected um, reduction in the amount of discovery, I think, under the commercial rules. The default there is, is kind of no, I don't think it says this, but the default thinking is no depositions, no interrogatories. But that's still in the discretion of the arbitrator, so those things can pan out. Um, we have one more, one more topic. Do we have time, Mark, for... One um, more. I'd like, if we can quickly address the, uh, do you want to continue with the pro se or the multiple case filings? I, both of those are, um, fall into uh, Christine's area of expertise. So maybe she can, <clears throat> she oh, can I, choose. I can um, just quickly highlight um, the pro se uh, program. I have found uh, recently that um, many uh, arbitrators serve in this area and we're very appreciative of it, but many uh, parties or advocates don't know it exists. Um, we do have a dedicated team handling pro se parties, uh, and that is where one party is not represented by counsel. It is not only in employment, it's in consumer, commercial, and construction. Um, and what I want to highlight here is there are, uh, in the pro se area, we have been very dedicated to providing information and education. And at times, I've had to provide uh, this information to some uh, advocates uh, because they're new to the arbitration world. There is... Uh, videos available on our website, uh, specifically stages of the arbitration process, presenting your case in arbitration, the cost of arbitration, and what happens after an arbitrator renders an award, which comes up uh, quite frequently. And within this pro se and this dedicated team that handles thousands of cases, and in 2020, we did see an increase of cases coming to the association where uh, there was a pro se party. Um, and we don't know whether that has to do with the pandemic, but we are tracking that. We also provide uh, information and resources to our pro se parties about what legal representation is available and specifically the ABA free legal answers, the ABA affordable legal services and many other uh, resources are there for the pro se parties. Um, and, and we anticipate um, talking about the future. Um, we do not uh, anticipate this caseload where one party is unrepresented uh, decreasing. We do see it increasing uh, as we experienced in 2020. So um, that's the thumbnail sketch uh, of pro se uh, programs. I always think I'll never have enough to say. And then sometimes I say, Christine, can you please stop talking? So um, we can go to the next slide. And as perhaps we just want to handle this, we'll incorporate it into questions. So I know there's okay. at least one question about multiple case filings. Okay. Um, and but at this point, I want to hand it over to Mark Travis, who has been following the, the, the chat. Um, and he can present questions that we have not already addressed. You with, you're still with us, Mark? Just wanted to unmute there. Sorry. Uh, so let's go ahead. And, uh, we can go ahead and follow up. I've got the, the questions sort of divided into three or four different areas. But if we want to talk about uh, the issues with multiple case filings, I think that also relates to one of the first questions that was asked, because these multiple case filings seem to me to follow fall into definition of employer employee. What's the workplace? So what are some of the issues with multiple case filings? How has that exhibited itself either to, to Jackie or Christine? Um, and what, in, in what scenarios does that exhibit itself and what challenges does it present? Christine, go right ahead. Well, I think that the challenges for uh, multiple case filings is, is the volume, uh, is the volume of cases that uh, potentially are filed. And there's, you know, the multiple case filing areas, there have always been groups of cases filed with us, whether 20, 25 that may have dealt with an overtime um, claims, which impact many. Um, you know, those have always been handled by the association. That's, you know, in my lifetime. 
uh, at the association. The cases where uh, we have experienced recently are, you know, 1,000, 1,500, um, even more than that cases filed at one time. And then one party wanting to everything done immediately and potentially, you know, how do you appoint the arbitrators? You still want to have the integrity. These are individual cases. We appoint individual arbitrators. They have to go through, you know, disclosure, appointment, making sure the integrity of the process is still in place. That takes a lot of time. Um, but we are uh, and continue to work with both sides on streamlining the process. Many of these multiple group filings go to mediation and it's been very successful. Uh, there have been batching of cases, there have been test cases. Um, so a lot is being worked on in this area that I think um, is allowing parties to come to uh, agreements on how to best handle it. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in that area and a lot of, I think, good faith effort by parties to try to resolve these cases. Jackie, do you have a thoughts on that from an arbitrator perspective? Uh, not really. I mean, the, the coordination of these, I think, is is the key. And I, I think uh, a lot of us uh, in this session today have had uh, the experience of of arbitrating um, a few or a bundle uh, out of the uh, uh, a larger um group of filings and it certainly presents um, interesting issues and um, I, I think that this is an area if it continues and uh, I think that's this is the one that that maybe um, if if nothing else is done in Congress I have a feeling that this is one that uh, that might um, be tweaked uh, a bit um, but uh, if, if they go forward I think that this is an area where um, there is a lot that can be done to to uh, enhance the efficiency and of course we see employers say uh, questioning whether it was so wise to do a class action waiver in the first place because they end up seeing the expense associated with hundreds of filings. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Several of the questions were about pros and cons, issues, um, challenges of uh, the in-person versus remote. So uh, I guess I could condense some of those to talk about um, you know, what are the, is, is, is the credibility question, is the credibility question really a, a valid issue with remote hearings? Uh, and also along that line, there was a question about timeliness of remote versus in-person. I tend to think you, you get a more timely, I know my calendar um, works better on a remote basis than in person. So um, both in terms of Credibility and timeliness and efficiency. Anybody want to uh, offer uh, Christine or, or Jackie any any thoughts on that? I'll let you start with that, Jackie, because okay. you're ex experiencing it. Although I, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about the credibility and how do I know what's going on in that room. Um, so, Jackie, as an arbitrator, I think I'll leave that one to you. Um, there are um, a fair number of arbitrators, and I, I know the, the, the late and wonderful uh, George Nicolau uh, spoke uh, of having done a series of, um, I, I think it was sports-related um, uh, hearings that were done entirely by telephone, and that he uh, had uh, um, faith and had no doubt uh, in the reliability of his credibility determinations based upon telephonic testimony. Um, and uh, I, I don't see there being a significant issue um, with credibility assessments, and especially now when people in appearing in person have to wear a mask, um, we, we don't have uh, that benefit of seeing the facial expressions uh, that you do with a camera right here. Um, with telephonic, you don't, but then the person testifying is aware that their face is not being seen. And so I think there are subtle changes in, in delivery. Um, but as for the, the shenanigans that might be going on, um, there are so many things that we can do. Um, and uh, technology is being developed also. I've done a fair number of hearings where there are a couple cameras using um, a device called the OWL or other devices where you can see the whole room if there are people physically together in a room or if you're concerned 
that uh, there may be someone lurking. Um, and my order in employment cases, I don't use it in labor cases, but my procedural order provides um, that I might at any time ask a witness to scan the room with a, cam with a camera. Um, and I know that it's possible that somebody coaching the witness can duck when the, <laughs> when the scanning is done, but you can tell, and I'm sure all the arbitrators uh, with us today can kind of uh, um, talk about their own experiences. But when something odd is going on, even when a witness is getting a, a hint via text or you know, reading intently something on the screen, you can tell. And so I think those initial fears of abuse of uh, the process um, because of the remote location of a witness or parties um, have uh, begun to subside. There are also I... startups um, that uh, use an artificial intelligence that uh, they try to assess whether the speaker is, uh, you know, their trustworthiness, along with a bunch of other metrics. I haven't seen it adopted. Uh, I doubt anyone in this room has relied on that yet. But thinking 10 years in the future, um, I, I think it's, it's uh, feasible that some of us in here are going to have some sort of augment, you know, we're going to have some AI augmented um, assessments at or at your disposal. I don't want to uh, put myself in that, uh, in the group of, of, of the arbitrators. Um, and that is what I see as, you know, it's looking to the future, it's managing these, like Jackie was saying, even, a, even just simple uh, remote hearings, uh, there, are, there are new issues. Are these people being coached? Um, likewise, that can apply to asynchronous, right? There are unique issues. I don't see asynchronous as necessarily problematic. Um, it's simply, I think uh, uh, we're gonna be thinking through some more problematic issues that, that attend it. Um, you know, I'll leave it back to Mark. Well, that, that's a good segue because I wanted to hit on uh, what you had said earlier, Mark, uh, about this, you were talking about then and earlier about the asynchronous new platforms and processes and so forth. And so could you give us a little bit in the little time we have remaining, a little bit more information on that, what, what, what you see as issues with that, what that looks like and what are the problems with it, if there are? Sure. So, I mean, so one, um, one provider that comes to mind is called Fair Claims. I don't, has anyone in the audience ever heard of Fair Claims and or been a Fair Claims arbitrator? <laughs> um, and so, and perhaps Christine, I've been tracking fair claims for a while. And before they used to handle claims under 50,000 yeah. and over 50,000, they, they left, typically the contracts left it to the triple. That's been creeping up. It's now a hot, you know, now it's only a hundred and above. They'll, they'll Are these throw. employment cases? Um, uh, and that it's kind of, not really, it's more in the consumer, okay. but I think I see it eating into it's on the margins, right? On the, well, is an Uber driver, is someone that is part of the gig economy, the sharing economy? Well, is, are they commercial hosts or employees? Uh, however, so um, they have a platform. Well, they'll tell you, um, that they'll tell the uh, consumer essentially, there's a 90% chance that Airbnb will settle with you if you accept $2,000, right? Uh, of a $20,000 claim. So it'll, you know, and I find that problematic. Uh, likewise, they'll give you badges, right? In terms of, right, this is the, this is the platinum level settlement, right? This is the gold level settlement. Um, it's those introducing those gamification elements um, to arbitration. Um, and that's what I, I deem as problematic, not necessarily just the asynchronous approach, but these startups, uh, I do think that there's room for innovation, right? Let's not ignore that, you know, the, the existing players, the existing processes, they can all be better. I think we all can agree on that, but not all changes are beneficial. Um, and I, I just think that, arbit you know, particularly employment arbitration is at a stage um, in its development where we're going to see rapid evolution in the next 10 years. I, I would just, we're running out of time and I know we have to end up. Some, someone had asked, uh, uh, this is really for Christine, in terms of the information that AAA provided to Congress, this was of interest to me too, 
Uh, is that like in a white paper or anything like that? Or is that, uh, is that I, available? I, I think it is available through the judiciary um, where we sent it, but I can check on that. Okay. I, okay. I mean, I, I believe it's out in the public forum. Okay. And could they, could they reach out to you to do, to get that? Or who would they, how would we get that? You can certainly, you know, I'll find out the 100% answer from, um, uh, and sure, my email address is very easy. It's newhallc at adr.org. Okay, right. I'd like to see that myself, actually. So, yeah. Okay. I think we're right at it, Mark. All right. So, I'm going to invite everybody to um, join Lyra and your complimentary dispute resolution interest section membership and or your local chapters. And I'm gonna invite everyone to, to stay on. There will be a 15 minute break, um, but at 1.15, I'm gonna hand uh, the uh, camera over to Mark Travis's session on what does the process of labor arbitration look like in the future? And I want to thank our sponsors, the NAA REF Research and Education Foundation, um, the, the, the AAA uh, uh, Association of Conflict Resolution. Uh, many universities have contributed to this and thank you to everyone that showed up. Uh, 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 you, you deserve recognition as well. Um, but I think there's gonna be a 15 minute break. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Good Thanks. to see everybody. <laughs>